This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 89. Coming up on Space Time, a massive explosion rocks the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way stealing galaxies from its neighbors, and the global storms launching dust towers into the Martian sky. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have found evidence of a cataclysmic flare that erupted out of the center of our Milky Way galaxy, affecting the Magellanic Stream, a trail of gas and stars linking our galaxy with two of our nearest galactic neighbors, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. The massive explosion erupted from the region of the supermassive black hole at our galactic center about three and a half million years ago, sending a cone-shaped burst of radiation through the galactic poles and out more than 200,000 light years into deep space. The findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal suggest the blast, known as a Seyfert flare, created two enormous ionization cones that slice through the Milky Way, getting with a relatively small diameter close to the black hole, and expanding dramatically as they exited the galaxy. This event was so powerful that it impacted the stream of gas and isolated stars which flow into the Milky Way from our two neighboring galaxies, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. One of the study's authors, Professor Lisa Cooley from the Australian National University, says this explosion is so huge it must have been triggered by Sagittarius A star, the Milky Way's central supermassive black hole. Located some 27,000 light years from Earth, Sagittarius A star has about 4.3 million times the mass of our Sun. The massive Seyfert flare must have looked like the glare of a lighthouse beam, suddenly turned on amidst the darkness, shining for perhaps 300,000 years. Cooley and colleagues studied the flare using data gathered by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and calculated the explosion would have taken place a little bit over 3 million years ago. Now, in galactic terms, that's astonishingly recent. On Earth at that time, Homo sapiens' ancient ancestors, the Australopithecines, were scavenging a living in Africa. The findings dramatically changed science's understanding of the Milky Way. It was always thought that our galaxy was a fairly quiet and active place with a not-so-bright centre. But instead, these new results open up the possibility of a complete reinterpretation of its evolution and nature. Cooley says the blast clearly shows that the centre of the Milky Way is a much more dynamic place than previously thought. The observations mean there's still a lot of work to be done to better understand how supermassive black holes evolve and how they influence and interact with the galaxies they're in. Seyfert flare is a massive amount of radiation. It's really high energy. It's X-rays and it's extreme UV rays. And it comes out of the accretion disk, which is a disk of material that's actually falling into the black hole. And so this is just this massive burst of energy in it. Usually they go in two directions. They can go up and down. And they're often flying out of a disk of of a galaxy. Those observations were made based on a combination of ground-based and Hubble Space Telescope data. And what we're seeing is these really extreme lines. So we're seeing lines from carbon and silicon. They're really, really extreme. We call them high ionization, which means that there's been many electrons have been ripped off these atoms. And the only thing that can do that is a very, very extreme radiation field. We're seeing them in two directions, up and down, and it definitely looks like there was a massive flare coming from the supermassive black hole in the centre of our galaxy to cause such extreme amounts of electrons being ripped off the atoms in the gas. It's a busy place, Sagittarius A star, even though it's a fairly quiet supermassive black hole compared to others. We've got these huge gamma ray lobes, Fermi lobes, that stretch above and below the galactic disk, which we think are generated by this black hole as well, and a lot of other activity. Yes, so we're thinking that it's actually more active in the past than we thought it was. So we know there's some activity like those gamma ray burst lobes and there's also emission that we can see in the radio as well. And 
This particular flare we think happened about 3.5 million years ago and that it actually went much further than any of those other events from the supermassive black hole. So we astronomers were used to thinking of this supermassive black hole in our galaxy as sort of a, a relatively inactive black hole because we've seen much more active ones in other galaxies. But this new observation suggests that it actually goes on and off and it's been more active in the past than it just is currently. And it's rich a fair way to space too, some 200,000 light years. That's where the Magellan Extreme is. That's right. So it looks like it's actually been impacting on the gas around the galaxy and it must have had a really massive force to be able to do that. So this black hole must have been being fuelled by a large amount of material at that time in order to cause this massive flare. When you say impacting, does that mean there's a shock front there or something impacting the Magellan oh, Extreme? Impact no, impact is from the, the extreme radiation. So there's right. X-rays and there's extreme UV rays and then that's been ripping off these electrons from the atoms really far out. And we just don't usually see it happening that far out. Is that your clue that this thing was there? Yes, yes. So definitely we're having a look at these absorption lines that we see in the ultraviolet. And we have to use the Hubble Space Telescope to do it because you've got to get some really fine detail, but you also have to get outside our own atmosphere, which absorbs UV light. So to have a look for these very special lines in the UV, we have to use a space telescope to do it. And you were specifically looking for some sort of ionisation cones, or, or, yes. or, or what brought yes. you to this? Yeah, so it was that? Yeah. yeah, specifically looking for some evidence of the Milky Way's impact on the Magellan Extreme or some on the other surrounding gas because what we don't understand is why do black holes turn on and turn off in the centres of galaxies and is our Milky Way special in any way or did it have a supermassive black hole that looked more like some of the other active galaxies that we see nearby? Did it look like that in the past? Were you one of the astronomers who were disappointed when the cloud sort of did it circle around the black hole and nothing happened? <laughs> yes, I, yes, I was. <laughs> Me too. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of big discoveries and <laughs> you know, I'm always hoping for more. Was it a cloud or was it a, a dismembered star? Oh, I think it was a cloud. Personally, but there is a bit of um, debate about that out there. Yeah, we, we all got very excited for a long time and then <laughs> and then nothing. So much for Christmas presents. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, we do see sometimes, we see some hypervelocity stars, which are these stars that oh, are travelling super fast. Just the other day, and they, yes. Yes, exactly. And they can go way outside the galaxy. Basically, they're on a path to be ejected from the galaxy. Uh, they're travelling so fast, so they're, they're always exciting. The event which caused the at flare. Any ideas as to what that could have been? Or something on the accretion yeah, disk, obviously? We, yeah, we've, we don't really know. Um, the accretion disks seem to go up and down, or they turn on and turn off as far as the amount of activity that they're doing. And it may be related to the amount of matter that's falling in. So maybe there was an infall of, of some gas coming into the galaxy, maybe a little dwarf galaxy, or something else that caused this more infall into the central regions. That would cause the accretion disk to be fueled uh, at a higher rate and then that can cause flares. That's Professor Lisa Cooley from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Well, speaking of the Magellanic Clouds, a new study has found that the Milky Way has been stealing satellite galaxies from the large Magellanic Cloud. Just like the Moon orbits the Earth, and the Earth orbits the Sun, and the Sun orbits around the centre of the Milky Way, galaxies also orbit each other, according to predictions of cosmology. For example, so far we know of more than 50 galaxies that are orbiting around the Milky Way. One of the largest of these is the Large Magellanic Cloud, a dwarf galaxy some 168,000 light-years away that resembles a faint cloud in the southern hemisphere night sky. Now, scientists have discovered that several of these dwarf galaxies orbiting the Milky Way were likely stolen from the Large Magellanic Cloud, including several ultra-faint dwarfs, but also some relatively bright and well-known satellite galaxies, such as Carina and Fornax. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, show how the Milky Way is feeding on its near neighbours through a process known as galactic cannibalism. The study's lead author, Laura Sales from the University of California, Riverside, says the results are an important confirmation of cosmological models. 
These predict that small dwarf galaxies in the universe should also be surrounded by a population of even smaller, fainter galactic companions. Sells and colleagues made their discovery by using data gathered by the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft, which was studying the motions of several nearby galaxies. They then compared that data with their own cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. The authors used the positions in the sky and the predicted velocities of material such as dark matter accompanying the Large Magellanic Cloud. They found that at least four ultra-faint dwarf galaxies and two classical dwarf galaxies, Carina and Fornax, used to be satellite galaxies of the Large Magellanic Cloud. However, through the ongoing merging process, a more massive Milky Way used its powerful gravitational field to tear apart the Large Magellanic Cloud and steal these galaxies. Remember, the Large Magellanic Cloud is a disrupted spiral galaxy, and the monster that disrupted it is our own galaxy, the Milky Way. It's the first time astronomers have been able to map the hierarchy of structure formation to such faint and ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. The findings have important implications for the total mass of the Large Magellanic Cloud and also for the formation of the Milky Way. Sales says if so many dwarfs came along with the Large Magellanic Cloud only recently, it means the properties of the Milky Way's satellite population just a billion years ago would have been radically different from what it is now, and that impacts science's understanding of how the faintest galaxies form and evolve. Now, as their name suggests, dwarf galaxies are small galaxies. They contain somewhere between a few thousand and a few billion stars. The authors use computer simulations from the Feedback in Realistic Environments, or FIRE, project to show that the Large Magellanic Cloud and galaxies similar to it host numerous tiny dwarf galaxies, many of which contain no stars at all, only dark matter, that mysterious invisible substance which scientists know exists because they can see its gravitational influence on the stuff around it. The large number of tiny dwarf galaxies seems to suggest that the dark matter content of the Large Magellanic Cloud is quite large, and that means that the Milky Way is probably undergoing the largest merger in its history right now, with its victim, the Large Magellanic Cloud, bringing as much as one-third the mass of the Milky Way's own dark matter halo, the halo of invisible material that surrounds our galaxy. The number of dwarf galaxies the Large Magellanic Cloud hosts may be higher than astronomers had previously estimated, and many of these tiny satellites have no stars. They're just gas and dark matter. Small galaxies are hard to measure, and it's possible that some already known ultra-faint dwarf galaxies are in fact associated with the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's also likely astronomers will discover new ultra-faints associated with the Large Magellanic Cloud. Of course, while dwarf galaxies can be satellites of larger galaxies, they can also be isolated, existing totally on their own and independent of any larger objects. In fact, the Large Magellanic Cloud used to be isolated, but it was captured by the gravity of the Milky Way and is now orbiting around it as a satellite. The Large Magellanic Cloud hosted at least seven satellite galaxies of its own, including its biggest companion, the Small Magellanic Cloud, prior to them both being captured by the Milky Way, which is now beginning to tidally strip them. There is a Magellanic bridge of stars and gas linking the large and small Magellanic clouds. And then, as we mentioned in our last story, a Magellanic stream linking the large Magellanic cloud with the Milky Way. The authors of this study now want to determine how satellites of large Magellanic cloud-sized galaxies form their stars, and how that relates to the amount of dark matter mass they have. It'll be interesting to see if they form stars differently to satellites of Milky Way-sized galaxies. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, global storms launch massive dust towers into the Martian sky, and Russia launches a new top-secret spy satellite designed to manoeuvre towards and study other satellites. All that and more still to come on Space Time. One of the big questions in planetary science is how Mars lost its water. There are many theories. And a new study suggests massive global dust storms on the Red Planet might provide a means of transporting Martian water into space. Dust storms are common on Mars, but every decade or so, something totally unpredictable happens. A series of runaway storms breaks out, covering the entire planet in a dusty haze. And just last year, a fleet of NASA spacecraft were in the box seat for a detailed look at the life cycle of the 2018 global dust storm, the same storm which ended the life of NASA's Opportunity Mars rover. 
And while scientists are still puzzling over the data, two papers have shed new light on a phenomena observed within the storm. Massive dust towers, concentrated clouds of dust that warm in the sunlight and rise high into the Martian atmosphere. Scientists think dust-trapped water vapour may be riding them like an elevator into space, where solar radiation can then break apart their molecules, helping Mars degas. In fact, it may well help explain just how Martian water disappeared over billions of years. These dust towers are massive churning clouds that are far denser and climb much higher into the sky than normal background dust in the thin Martian atmosphere. And while they also occur under normal conditions, the towers appear to form in greater numbers during global storms. A tower will normally start on the red planet's surface as a region of rapidly lifted dust covering an area over 70 kilometers wide. But by the time these dust towers reach altitudes of around 80 kilometers, as seen during the 2018 global dust storm, they may be over 700 kilometers wide. Then, as the tower decays, it can form a layer of dust 60 kilometres above the ground that can be thousands of kilometres across, as large as Australia or the continental United States. The new research into Martian dust towers is based on data gathered by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, which can see through the haze using its heat-sensing Mars Climate Sounder instrument, which is specially designed for measuring dust levels. The data, coupled with images from a camera aboard the orbiter, allowed scientists to detect numerous swelling dust towers. Dust towers appear throughout the Martian year, but the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter observed something very different during the 2018 global dust storm. The study's lead author, Nicholas Heavens from Hampton University, says normally the dust would fall back down to the Martian ground in a day or so. But during the global dust storm of 2018, the dust towers were renewed continuously for weeks. In some cases, multiple towers were seen for as long as three and a half weeks. In fact, the rate of dust activity surprised scientists. But especially intriguing was the possibility that the dust towers act as well, sort of space elevators for other material, transporting them up through the atmosphere. You see, when airborne dust heats up, it creates updrafts that carry gases along with it. And that would include the small quantities of water vapour sometimes seen as wispy clouds on Mars. A previous study led by Heavens showed that during a 2007 global dust storm on Mars, water molecules were lifted high into the upper atmosphere, where solar radiation could break them down into particles that could then degas into space. And that might be a clue as to how the red planet lost its lakes and rivers over billions of years, becoming the freeze-dried desert it is today. Scientists still can't say with any certainty exactly what causes these global dust storms to evolve. In fact, they've studied less than a dozen so far. But Martian global dust storms are really unusual, and there's nothing like them on Earth. Still, with time and more data, scientists hope to better understand the dust towers created within these global storms and what role they could play in removing the water from the red planet's atmosphere. This is Space Time, coming up later in the Science Report. The growing effects of climate change becoming more and more apparent... And a new study shows that people with manipulative tendencies are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. All that and more, still to come on Space Time. An Ariane 5 ECA heavy lift rocket has carried two new satellites into orbit. Ariane Space Flight VA249 blasted off into clear blue skies from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. The mission's payload included the Intelsat 39 and EDRSC telecommunications satellites, which were both placed into geostationary transfer orbits. À tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage du vulcan. Allumage du ZRP et décollage. La manœuvre en roulis du par notre bourse en nomino. Right on time, Ariane 5 began her mission lifting off from the ground here in French Guiana with a lot of fire and with two new satellites rising into the bright blue sky. The exhaust flames of gold, the two boosters providing 90, that's 90% of our thrust right now, propelling the launcher along her trajectory at an ever higher velocity. 
775 tons at liftoff, hard to believe. But to get that sort of mass off the ground, you need a lot of push. She's burning five tons of fuel every second. Two and a half tons are burning every second in each of the boosters. Plus, the core stage, the middle stage, burning another 300 kilos of fuel every second. Ariane 5 is now following the program in the onboard computer, which gives all the orders, including stage separations. Ariane on her way east across the Atlantic. Right now, the first flight phase, a single first stage engine and the two boosters are burning. Boosters burn just over two minutes. Nominal, la trajectoire est nominal. Tous les paramètres bord sont normaux. The DDO says everything is, is perfect on board, and he's announced the separation of the boosters, the flames of the two boosters flaming out in the bright blue sky. The single first stage in engine is burning now, taken over from the uh, boosters. The boosters will fall. La uh, est nominal, la trajectoire est nominal, tous les paramètres bord sont normaux. DDO says everything is nominal on board. The boosters fall 500 kilometers from shore into a protected area. Our altitude, 104 kilometers. Our speed, 2.27 kilometers per second. The speed we need to inject the satellites, roughly 8 or 9 Separation kilometers like per second as we've separated the fairing. Built by Space Systems Laurel, the 6,600 kilogram Intelsat 39 will cover broadband networking and video distribution services across Africa, Europe, the Middle East and Asia. Asia in both C and KU bands. It's the 61st satellite launched by Ariane Space for Intelsat and will replace the Intelsat 902, which was also launched by Ariane Space way back in 2001. The European Data Relay System, or EDRSC, satellite is the second node of the fourth satellite Airbus Space Data Highway Network constellation. EDRS uses laser technology to relay information and data between satellites, spacecraft, aircraft and ground stations, thereby cutting the time needed for satellites to deliver information to the ground. The system is designed to provide almost full-time communications even with satellites in low Earth orbit that often have reduced visibility from ground stations. It makes on-demand data available for services such as rescue workers who need near-real-time satellite data in emergency situations. This report from ESA TV. At Europe Spaceport in Kourou, the new EDRSC satellite is undergoing final preparations before its launch. An Ariane 5 will lift the satellite into geostationary orbit, where it will join EDRSA, which was launched in 2016 as a hosted payload on UTELSAT 9B as part of the European Data Relay System. The European Data Relay System is a collaboration between ESA and Airbus Defence and Space, aiming to improve and accelerate data transmission from low Earth orbiting satellites to the ground. From their geostationary orbit, EDRS satellites can both see the low orbiting imaging satellite as well as the ground stations. Data from the imaging satellite is sent via a laser link to EDRS which then transmits data via radio frequency to the ground stations. This process allows for longer and faster data transfers, creating the Space Data Highway. EDRS is called a Space Data Highway because it's likened to an optical fiber in the sky. It's a highway through which data travels at enormous speeds, in the case of EDRS at up to 1.8 gigabits per second. And if you compare this to a conventional internet connection at home, you can say that it's about 100 times the speed that you get with your internet connection when you surf at home. So that's a real highway for data in space. The main features of EDRS are a high transfer rate achieved by the use of laser technology and a near permanent availability, a result of the satellite's bird's eye view from geostationary orbit. This results in a quasi real-time availability of the data on the ground a step forward from conventional systems that only allow data transfers for 10 out of every 90 minutes. EDRS is the first commercial system in the world to use optical communication between satellites. While the system has been jointly developed by ESA and Airbus, it is the latter who will operate the service. The launch of today's EDRS-C satellite is a fantastic opportunity for enhancing our space data highway system. With Space Data Highway, Airbus is the first connectivity operator of laser communication services. 
Already today, Space Data Highway links all the four Copernicus satellites near real time to the Earth and it will allow with the second satellite to have near real time data of two Earth observation satellites at the same time. A fantastic innovation. Also, it will be of course a backup of the first satellite in case we have a problem. EDRSC is the first dedicated EDRS satellite. It will provide additional capacity to the European Data Relay System, but also improve its robustness and further increase coverage. Once both nodes are fully operational, EDRS will be able to relay at least 50 terabytes of data every day. Today, ESA and Airbus are already working on a third node, EDRS-D, which will be positioned over the Asia-Pacific region and mark another step towards worldwide use of this breakthrough technology. The ultimate goal will of course be to achieve global coverage so that we can transmit imagery that is taken anywhere in the world to Europe within quasi real time, meaning almost immediately. And there is a great future in using EDRS with our new Pleiad NEO satellites, 30 centimeter resolution coming soon. From 2021 onwards, we will be providing you with more high-resolution, near-real-time data for Earth observation applications, and I'm very proud of that. With higher resolutions and better imaging techniques, the amount of data provided by low-Earth orbiting satellites will only increase further in years to come. Therefore, both ESA and Airbus are convinced that optical communication in space is a key technology, allowing us to fully exploit these vast amounts of data. EDRS is the beginning of a new era in space-based telecommunications, and the launch of EDRSC is another step towards the completion of the Space Data Highway. And that report by ESA TV included ESA's EDRS project manager Michael Whitting and Everett Dudock, the head of communications, intelligence, and security with Airbus Defence and Space. Russia has launched another classified military surveillance satellite from its Plesetsk Cosmodrome, 800 kilometres north of Moscow. The launch aboard a Soyuz 2.1V rocket, equipped with a Volga upper stage, placed the spy satellite into a near-polar orbit with an altitude ranging from 365 to 855 kilometres. The top-secret payloads understood to include an Inspector-class spacecraft, which is designed to approach, monitor and study other satellites. The clandestine probes also equipped with high-resolution optical imaging systems to undertake surveillance missions. Moscow describes its Soyuz 2.1V rocket as a light carrier. It's based on the current Soyuz 2 launch vehicle, but without the usual four strap-on liquid-fueled first-stage boosters and using a single kerosene-fueled NK-33 main engine, replacing the usual four-nozzle core-stage engine flown on other Soyuz configurations. This launch was similar to that of another Soyuz 2.1V flight back in June 2017. It also deployed a secret payload into a similar orbit. That flight carried a military spacecraft designed to collect geodetic measurements to update and improve Russian nuclear missile guidance and targeting systems. That spacecraft also later released the small Inspector-class satellite designed to approach and study other satellites in orbit. Meanwhile, China's busy end-of-year launch schedule is continuing to ramp up without any signs of a let-up in flights. Chinese commercial launch company Xpace used its Kuazhou 1A solid-fueled rocket to carry the KL Alpha A and KL Alpha B micro satellites into orbit from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in Ganzhou Province, northwestern China. The two spacecraft will be used to test new KA band communication technology. Just a few days later. Beijing launched a Long March 3B rocket from a Zhai Chang satellite launch center in southwestern China's Sichuan province, carrying another pair of Bidao 3 or Compass navigation satellites. The two 1,014 kilogram spacecraft are the 50th and 51st members of the Bidao constellation and are equipped with lightweight hydrogen maser clocks, phased array antennas for navigation signals, and laser retro reflectors. They were deployed into 21,500 kilometer high medium Earth orbits. The Bidal flight was followed just five days later by the launch of a Long March 4C rocket from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northern China's Jiangxi province, carrying another Gaofeng Earth observation satellite. Beijing describes the Gaofeng 12 as a microwave remote sensing satellite capable of providing images with resolutions of under a meter. It'll join the growing Gaofeng constellation, undertaking high resolution land surveys, urban planning, road network design, crop yield estimates, 
disaster relief, global belt and road projects and allowing Beijing to keep an eye on the activities of other countries. The mission was the 320th flight for the Long March series rocket. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A survey of more than 300 people with close links to the Australian environment, such as farmers, graziers and birdwatchers, shows that they're already noticing climate change impacts on hundreds of species and ecosystems across the country. A report in the journal PLOS One found that generally the most common changes people in the survey attributed to climate change were plants dying, changes in plant seasonal effects and changes in animal abundances. The researchers found that the overarching pattern suggests that people are more often noticing climate change losers such as native species rather than winners in their local areas. The authors say the observations were generally consistent with expectations from models predicting moderate to high degrees of change in biodiversity across Australia by 2050. Coral researchers have been working day and night across the Great Barrier Reef to complete a radically new approach to mass coral reseeding, successfully rearing millions of hardy coral babies following the reef's mass coral spawning event. The coral, I guess you'd call it IVF team, was led by Southern Cross University's Professor Peter Harrison, and it captured millions of coral sperm and eggs during the synchronised breeding event. The team then successfully reared and turbocharged the coral larvae with algae symbionts ready to replenish heavily degraded sections of the reef. Leaked Chinese government documents have shown how Beijing is using unprecedented mass surveillance techniques to develop and feed algorithms specifically designed to identify people for investigation based purely on their travel history and the type of messaging apps they use. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are shedding more light on the country's process for detaining more than a million people in so-called re-education camps. One leaked intelligence briefing note describes how officials rounded up more than 15,000 people flagged by the algorithm in just a week and then placed them in internment camps. The Chinese embassy in the United Kingdom has called the leaked documents pure fabrication. Two lion cubs are the latest find to set Egyptologists are buzzing following a raft of exciting new discoveries. A report in the journal Nature claims the lion cubs were found along with other feline mummies and animal statues at a necropolis dig site south of Cairo. This latest archaeological news follows the discovery last month of 30 sealed coffins and their mummified human contents at a dig site near Luxor. A new study has found that people who believe in the supernatural and those who express manipulative tendencies are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. The findings reported in the journal PLOS One are based on an investigation of the so-called dark triad of psychological traits, Machiavellianism, psychopathy and narcissism. In a survey of 230 people, the authors report that alongside supernatural thinking, Machiavellian or manipulative and psychopathic, that is callous, emotionally detached traits, were the strongest predictors of conspiracy beliefs. However, they found no significant relationship between narcissism and a belief in conspiracy theories. The findings shed new light on the origin of conspiracy theories and how such beliefs gain traction. An anti-vaxxer has come up with a new con trick to try and discourage people from getting vaccinations from their local doctor. He enters the medical centre inferring but not actually claiming to be a government official and then insists that any and all vaccination promotional material be removed immediately or further action will be taken. Ooga booga. Leaving the employees to think legal action would be pending. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the hoax's actions are concerning on several counts. Firstly, it could encourage other anti-science or anti-medicine proponents to carry out similar actions, but equally worrying was how compliant and unchallenging the clinic staff, including the doctor, were to the hoax's assertions that he had the authority to demand the posters be removed. There's a story in Melbourne in which an um, anti-vaccination campaigner entered a medical clinic and basically went in there and said, I'm required to ask you to take down your vaccination posters. And then he started quoting the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Now, he never said, I'm actually from the 
TGA, but he did say, I will have to ask you to take them down. I'm required for you to take them down. If they are not taken down, I will have to come back. And so he definitely gave the impression that he was acting in some official capacity. He actually then uh, went in and spoke to a doctor and gave him the same message. And the poor doctor was a bit confused by it. And of course, he flashes this TGA stuff in, in front of the doctors, in front of the receptionists, and it doesn't say that at all. In fact, the TGA says doctors are not allowed to put promotional material of particular products in their waiting room, in their clinics, etc. But this is government mandated information on vaccination, saying get vaccinated. It doesn't say which product. That's legal to do that. So this fellow who came in was bluffing his way through, claiming illegalities or some sort of breach of regulations when it wasn't. And he's filming it all. Now, he's filming it presumably with a concealed camera as he's wandering around the clinic. And there's people there, there's patients there, women men, children, etc., sitting down there waiting for their turn to go see a doctor, and they're being filmed. So he's filmed the that, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And they might not want to be identified as sitting in the clinic, you know. And then he films the staff, the receptionist, etc., walking around the waiting room, taking down these posters, and he's saying, there's another one over there, there's another one over there. It's not just brazen, it's false representation, it's using a concealed camera, and it's quite possibly... Well, it's against the Listening um, Devices Act as well. That's right, absolutely, yeah. And it's quite possibly impersonating a government official which you can be thrown into jail for. This guy's obviously an anti-vaxxer. Um, how dangerous is this sort of an action? The action is extremely dangerous. He, he's an anti-vaxxer. He's an actor as well, although it doesn't seem that good. <laughs> but uh, he's an anti-vaxxer. And on his Facebook page, he does actually, ha or he did have links to the, the videos he filmed. He, he published them. There are other people saying, this is great. What can we do about it? What can we do here? In other words, there was indications that other people might be following suit. And therefore, you're going to get a bevy of anti-vaxxers going around impersonating people insisting that posters are taking back. These are posters warning about pertussis in pregnant women. Women in their later stages of pregnancy can get vaccinated against pertussis, whooping cough. These are important issues, and to have this information taken down is reckless. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 